Okay, so I thank the uh, organizers for a very interesting conference and uh, take this opportunity to talk, to talk about some work that uh, did a while ago, but uh, seems like uh, it is related these days to uh, topological states of matter because uh, one of the avenues to topological states of matter is through uh, creating uh, topological band structures using light. And uh, this work was actually uh, looking at a very striking effect uh, on quantum Hall systems in a regime that's usually not very striking, which is the weak magnetic field, <coughs> high Landau levels, um, and uh, not, zero, not exactly zero temperature, where whole systems behave classically, uh, don't show any redeeming features, um, and uh, no plateaus in the whole resistivity, and uh, no Shubnikov the Hass oscillations. But once uh, light is sh shining on the uh, sample, uh, very dramatic effects happen. So uh, uh, at the time, uh, there were some uh, approaches to this uh, picture, but I found that the Floquet approach, which is uh, an approach that was previously mostly used, not for condensed matter, but for uh, quantum optics problems, was actually very useful to actually uh, do calculations in the non-equilibrium uh, strongly uh, uh, irradiated uh, condensed matter system. So I want to show you how it works. It's mostly a theoretical talk with a little uh, reference to the experiments in that uh, field. So uh, first I'll describe why Floquet Hamiltonians uh, appear in condensed matter, and then uh, discuss how you can treat the periodically driven Landau levels with disorder and calculate uh, conductivity uh, and uh, photoconductivity. And especially what's interesting in this system is that one can actually compute nonlinear photoconductivity uh, in a controlled way. Um, and uh, this is actually a, a system that the Floquet approach is very useful. So the Floquet approach is applied to Hamiltonians that have uh, periodic time modulation. Uh, let's say their period is tau. And, uh, one uh, writes the evolution operator as a product of W, which is a unitary that is periodic in tau, times uh, evolution operator that looks like it has a time-independent Hamiltonian called h-bar. And the question is, what is this h-bar? So h-bar is uh, evaluated by uh, looking at the eigenvalues of the evolution operator after a period tau. And those eigenvalues are called Floquet frequencies. Uh, it also has a Floquet wave functions, and these are these alphas. So uh, once you get these uh, frequencies and these wave functions, uh, you notice that the frequencies can only live on a circle, so there's no uh, order on them. Um, there's just a bunch of numbers that uh, live between uh, zero and uh, omega. And uh, the Floquet Hamiltonian uh, is given in terms of these frequencies. So this Floquet Hamiltonian will actually tell you what are the states that come back to themselves after a period. These uh, Floquet eigens, eigenstates uh, are periodic. Uh, you can see that these two arrows, they're doing some uh, rotation in Hilbert space, but after period omega, they come back to themselves. So they're the most natural basis to describe steady states that essentially describe time independent on long time scales uh, observables, and a natural basis to actually describe the distribution matrix and the uh, uh, the density matrix of the system. Uh, so uh, when this uh, approach is applied to uh, very simple band structure models, we've seen lots of band structures today, so perhaps some of them could be, uh, could be treated uh, this way. So if you have non-interacting electrons and you apply uh, time-dependent perturbation, a very simple one that couples, let's say, between two different bands, uh, this uh, time-dependent perturbation will mix the bands. And when you solve for the Floquet band structure, you'll get uh, what you see below, essentially the colliding of these two bands with a gap that's actually, uh, the gap is uh, proportional to the size of the perturbation, the time-dependent perturbation. It's called a Rabi splitting, if you want. And uh, the Floquet Hamiltonian is actually the band structure you see below. Of course, one asks, uh, what, what does this band structure tell you? Well, uh, in uh, Certain cases, uh, as uh, uh, Netanel Lindner and collaborators showed, and uh, Herb Fertig uh, with uh, 
uh, with his collaborators showed, uh, including myself, is that you can uh, get topological band structure uh, from relatively benign uh, band structures like a semiconductor with spin orbit coupling. Uh, when you uh, transform it under radiation, it becomes topological, non trivial topological. You can see the uh, edge states uh, in the gap that's formed by the uh, radiation. And uh, in graphene, uh, you can turn a non topological graphene to a topological graphene, which means it will have edge states and that will carry current uh, exactly uh, the same way using uh, the Floquet transformation. So these uh, uh, were uh, exploited in uh, several different ways, and uh, lots of people are thinking about trying to apply those things. Um, but I want to go back and uh, show you. Uh, OK, so first of all, an important question that arises and actually was treated uh, in different approaches is what do you do about the density matrix? I told you that there's a Floquet Hamiltonian that is a bunch of frequencies. A density matrix, if you want to write a Boltzmann uh, weight, for instance, you would need to have uh, uh, an ordering relation on the eigenvalues such that high energies will have less probability than low energies. But if they're all sitting in a circle and there's no ordering, uh, you have to uh, find a way to order them. And um, we've argued that if you take the system and you couple it well to a heat path of temperature T, such that there's no heat, uh, th there's no temperature difference effectively between the system and the heat bath. It's in, equi in thermal equilibrium. It gives and gets energy from the heat bath. It could give more energy in and then getting from the heat bath, but not such that it will give you a temperature gradient, then uh, the, the density matrix is, in fact, the steady state density matrix is, in fact, diagonal in the Floquet basis. And its weights should be given simply by the averaged uh, energies over a period, so that no effectively energy is actually f strongly flowing in or out from the system. And that's what you do in thermodynamics when you argue that the Boltzmann weight is what it is. So uh, energy conservation uh, will mean that you have to average over time. And now you have an ordering relation, because when you take the Hamiltonian and you average over time on the Floquet state, you'll get a number between minus infinity and infinity. And that's uh, the, the way we get the density matrix. So in the case of the microwave-induced resistance oscillation, um, which prompted us to think about Floquet, uh, the, uh, the experimental signatures were very striking. If you look at the uh, red line, which is actually the system which is not irradiated, so it's a bad choice of colors here, but the red line is actually the dark system uh, where you see the RXX versus magnetic field. And uh, in, the, um, in the region of uh, weak magnetic fields, you hardly see any, any Shubnikov the Haas oscillation. At strong magnetic fields, you see the Shubnikov the Haas oscillation. And uh, this is uh, essentially um, the region of the quantum Hall states. And this is the high Landau level states. Now, uh, the Hall effect, as you can see in this central region, is very, very flat. There's no plateaus. Uh, under radiation, you get the blue curves. And this is strong microwave radiation. The oscillations you see here have nothing to do with the Shubnikov de Haas oscillations. They have a different frequency. So while the Shubnikov de Haas is determined by the filling fraction, being, uh, let's say, every oscillation is an integer times uh, e squared of h, the uh, blue curve, the microwave-induced oscillation, has to do with the frequency of the microwave relative to the frequency of the uh, cyclotron uh, frequency, which is Eb of mc. This is uh, gallium arsenide, very, very clean, very high mobility. The, the most high mobility samples that have been seen. The temperature is actually the temperature which, which kind of masks these oscillations. So it's, it's 2D. 2D, yeah. It's a two-dimensional electron gas. It's the usual quantum hall. Uh, it comes from the uh, von Klitzing group, uh, and there was also from Zudov's group. I think Lauren Pfeiffer is always the uh, creator of these uh, great samples. So uh, what, what you see here is uh, a new phenomena that somehow exposes at high temperature in a regime that you would think the system is completely classical high temperature relative to the omega C, uh, and, and uh, there should be no quantum mechanics, as, as usually we teach our students, when temperature is larger than the level splitting. But once you put light on the system, suddenly you expose the actual discreteness of the original Hamiltonian's uh, Landau levels. And 
these oscillations is a very dramatic uh, effect. So the question is how to describe. Now it becomes more technical. What is the size of these oscillations? And what happens here is also a very interesting case. You see the oscillation stops and kind of flattens out and looks like this system has zero conductance or zero resistance uh, in the quantum hole set. So these questions are what I ask here. Why does the conductivity change sign? I'll soon show you that the answer is yes. What is the magnitude of the microwave-induced oscillations? And what does this order have to do with everything here? Obviously, to get Rxx not equal to zero, you need to know how to treat this order, because without this order, Rxx and sigma xx are zero. Uh, and um, you need a microscopic theory. So to get the microscopic theory, the Floquet transformation is very useful. So uh, to remind you, uh, clean Landau levels have uh, these uh, Landau operators, pi x, pi y, defined by these uh, kinetic terms. And they uh, commute to give you uh, I. And uh, the, the, it's essentially a harmonic oscillator uh, with uh, frequency h bar omega c. And um, that's why you get Landau levels, uh, integer space Landau levels. Uh, if you calculate the Kobo formula for the conductivity, it's the classical result, NEC over B. And there's absolutely no dissipation in this problem. If you want to put this order in this problem, there's a bit of a technical difficulty because of the degeneracy of Landau levels. So it's very difficult to do perturbation theory in anything when you have degeneracies. But uh, that's uh, something that uh, was known how to take care of. Um, the Floquet theory is one where you take now this operator's pi. Instead of pi vector squared, you add just a constant in space uh, electric field. It could be. Uh, both a DC and an AC component, as, you, as I write here in the Fourier components. So the advantage of the Floquet transformation in the Hall case is you could do nonlinear dependence on both the AC and the DC field. So you can get the DC nonlinear conductance, for instance, uh, for the same price. So you put in such a gauge field into this Hamiltonian, and you want to use the Floquet transformation to transform this Hamiltonian to a time-independent Hamiltonian. And this Floquet transformation is given by W, which is simply a function of the pi x and pi y, or some function of time. So this transformation is very simple to write down exactly. Diagonalize the um, evolution operator time t, and you get a Floquet Hamiltonian that, lo and behold, just looks like the original dark Hamiltonian. Has the same frequencies, same uh, ends, but it has Floquet states, n of k. Uh, in fact, the energies, if you want to know what are the energies of every state, it's exactly the energies of the dark state. So the average uh, Hamiltonian happens to be equal to the, uh, the original um, Hamiltonian uh, that you started out from. So this is, uh, seems to be so simple that it's trivial. Uh, you just get, in the Floquet transformation, the same harmonic oscillator. But we know that harmonic oscillators, if you drive them, linearly with a time-dependent force. They stay harmonic oscillators. The spectrum stays the same. And uh, that's not surprising. But what is nice is that we can now think about what you do with this order. So if you put any kind of potential of space and you transform it with a Floquet operator, it'll start rattl uh, rattling around so that the position will just move periodically. And now you don't have a time-independent potential. So you, this Floquet transformation doesn't work for the disorder. Uh, however, there are degrees of freedom called guiding center coordinates, which is another combination of R and P, that commute with W and commute with pi. And because they commute both with the Floquet transformation and with pi, uh, if you add to the Hamiltonian a term that only depends on R, and let's say you write the original disorder Hamiltonian as something that just depends on R, and something that depends all pi and R, and argue that this could be large and this could be small, you can incorporate a large part of the disorder in the Hamiltonian that can be Floquet transformed. So this is what we do here. We construct this V of R. So assuming you have some disorder that has some uh, correlation WQ. So it's a white noise 
it's not white noise, but it's a, it's a random disorder with some uh, spectral function. If you write the matrix elements of this disorder in a same Landau level at different values of the uh, k, which are eigenvalues of the guiding center coordinate, uh, this is the usual way people write down. It, it, it's in terms of Laguerre polynomials and the uh, Fourier transform of the uh, disorder potential. Uh, if you argue that this part of the, of the disorder, which is long wavelength, is large, there's a simple way you can break up the disorder into the dependence on R, the guiding center, and the rest. And that's just take the matrix elements that you got in one block and repeat them all over. And now you have a way of writing a disorder that commutes with the guiding center because it's essentially a unit matrix in terms of pi's, in terms of the raising and lowering of the Landau levels. And therefore, if this kind of disorder is added to the Hamiltonian, you know what to do with it when you put a time-dependent field. You just diagonalize uh, this Hamiltonian irrespective of the fields that you put in. So you write the Hamiltonian as essentially the old Landau clean Hamiltonian plus this disorder Hamiltonian. You diagonalize it, you'll get broadened Landau levels, gets rid of the degeneracy problem we said before that uh, you have when you have degenerate Landau levels. The broadening is dependent on the size of these uh, matrix elements V. And if you calculate the current in this Hamiltonian with any field you put in, you get it's a pure whole current. There's no dissipative part. And the whole coefficient is just a classical value. And it's independent of temperature and any fields you put on. By the way, this is uh, the only way I know how to prove to classes if you have to do it that the classical Hall coefficient is correct even when you have disorder, if you put the disorder this way. Now, of course, this is not the full story. There are transitions between Landau levels that I did not include in the Hamiltonian. And these are precisely the ones that give rise to the dissipative conductivity I want to calculate. And if it's small relative to the large number, V of L, I can do perturbation theory to second order and get an analytic expression and a numerical expression for the uh, uh, current versus voltage and a magnetic field. That's what we do here. So we calculate the second order, just Fermi-Golden rule, contribution of the short-range disorder, which uh, couples between different Landau levels. And this is a long expression, but very easy to compute numerically. Uh, it includes the DC field. It includes the AC field to any order you want. And it includes the effects of temperature through the Fermi Dirac. As we said, we're assuming uh, thermal equilibrium with a bath. And this expression is the nonlinear dependence of the current versus voltage. And it's written in terms of some functions. Uh, the most important thing in this expression is we found what is the figure of merit for these oscillations. The, remember, the first question was, what is the size of these microwave-induced oscillations? Well, the size grows when the broadening of the Landau levels becomes very narrow. So if the Landau levels uh, uh, broadening is less than the splitting, in other words, well-defined Landau levels, which you don't see because you're at high temperatures, but if you cool to zero temperature, you'll see well-defined Landau levels, then the size of these uh, Miro microwave-induced resistance oscillations will be large. And that's the figure of merit that we figured out. And uh, indeed, experiments show that the Landau levels are very narrow. This is an experiment of nonlinear conductivity without microwave showing very narrow Landau levels compared to the omega C. So uh, the results are the following. You get oscillations of the conductivity. The oscillations grow as the microwave energy goes up, up to the point that it crosses zero and becomes negative. And you get a negative conductivity. So you have here uh, the Kubo results, uh, not the Kubo, but this uh, Floquet Kubo results that uh, give us the uh, value of the dark conductivity, the value of the oscillations. And what's important to notice is the characteristic energy scale. So the characteristic energy scales for these oscillations is, again, the Landau level broadening that we get from the long range disorder. And uh, the magnitude, as I said, is the ratio of the microwave frequency to the Landau level broadening. Now, all this negative part, how much time do you have? Oh, OK. All this negative part is very interesting for its own sake. 
because you say, you're not used to seeing negative conductivities usually, and you say, what does it mean to have a resistor that you apply a voltage and the current flows upstream? Uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, I, I should, I, you know, I went a bit fast here about the physics. I just showed the mathematics of calculating it from the Floquet. But there was an explanation, physical explanation, previous to our calculation by Durst et al. from Yale as a group, uh, I think uh, Nick Reed, so Bill Such, Dave, Durst, and Girvin were on it. And they said uh, uh, the reason you get an upstream current, but they couldn't really calculate that current and what's its magnitude and whether it really changes the sign of the conductivity. But the reason for you getting any upstream behavior is that um, if you think about Landau levels, and here's more or less the chemical potential. Now you're at high temperature, so you have occupations of all these states. And you put an electric field, a finite electric field. So this is putting an electric field that goes this way. Then the Landau levels go down. And now non-equilibrium physics will tell you, OK, you, or tr linear transport will get you get particles here essentially flowing downstream because you, you put an electric field in this direction. That's the dark conductivity. But there is a contribution that will come if you take the light to be a bit above this distance. So if you take omega to be a bit larger than omega c, omega c is the vertical spacing, then a particle will be excited. Once it reaches here, it will be scattered by this order. And you can see that the density of states is much higher to the right than to the left. So overall, there will be an imbalance of current flowing upstream uh, when you have a detuning which is positive, and of course the opposite effect when the detuning is negative, and that's exactly these oscillations. Now, the fact that this current can overcome the dark current is kind of a surprise, but that's what comes out of the Floquet theory. And uh, we, in fact, get the scale of the nonlinearity very strongly. So you get this very weird pump that uh, the light is pumping electrons upstream once you put an electric field. Now the question is, what does it mean for transport if you put the system in the, uh, in, in, under the microwave and, and you look for the transport? So as you can see, the transport, this is now very carefully looking at these uh, flat areas below here where the resistivity looks like it's zero. So I, I just for those who don't get confused, resistivity zero in a clean quantum hall is equivalent to conductivity zero, right? And anybody wants to, it's just you invert the tensor and zero goes to zero. So uh, zero uh, resist resistance states here are actually places of negative conductivity or negative resistivity. How do you go from negative conductivity to zero? That's something that was worked out by uh, by Andrea Valener and uh, Andy Millis uh, using simple arguments. Uh, they were essentially saying, once, I, once I, uh, I have a system that when I put an electric field, the current flows upstream. So I put an electric field this way, and J goes this way, then the current will go upstream and pile up charges such that eventually it will stop running, and it will stop running when I create an electric field that cancels this current. So if you want to show it uh, simply, you draw the current versus field graphs. And you see that it has to rise eventually, because at very strong fields, of course, the system will break down and just have the current in the direction of the field. So there must be a zero crossing. But the zero crossing is actually the point of stability. The system is unstable to flow to this point, and what it means is that there will be no currents flowing, and the system will have finite domains of electric fields. Um, uh, making this theory a bit more uh, firmer on firmer grounds was uh, done by, uh, uh, by, by uh, Bert Halperin and myself and Amelia Kobe, where uh, we phrased this steady state condition as a minimization of a very interesting functional called the Apuno functional, um, which is a, a functional used for uh, uh, nonlinear differential equations to find uh, fixed points. And uh, I think, OK, so I'm, I'm nearly finished. But um, 
uh, just to remind, uh, just to give you, a, you know, a short short statement about Lyapunov function, which I, I like a lot, uh, especially because of this nice uh, picture of Lyapunov. Uh, many of you are familiar with Lyapunov exponents in uh, in uh, semi-classical behavior, but this is a different thing. This is uh, a functional of currents, which uh, needs to be minimized in order to find steady states. The functional is actually an integral, as you can see, the integral of the current over electric fields from zero to the value of the field we're at. This is the functional that, in certain cases, which the quantum hole uh, with constant hole coefficient applies, okay, and so there's some conditions for it. Uh, when you have constant hole coefficient, you, the Oppuno functional is minimized at the steady states, which solve the Kirchhoff equation. And, um, it's actually the global minimum of Lyapunov functional, which is the most stable steady state. So the zero crossing that we saw before is actually a minimum of the Lyapunov functional. So what does it mean? It means that if you're sitting at a finite field with zero current, the system is actually forming these fields. Now it can form a positive field and a negative field. It doesn't have to, to form necessarily a field in a certain direction. If it's higher dimensions, it could be fields in every direction. The magnitude of the field is going to be given by this point. Uh, a big question was, what is that magnitude of the field? And that's what the Floquet theory gave us. It gave us the magnitude of these fields. These fields are formed in the system, and the reason the system shows absolute zero, or close to zero resistance, or zero conductance, is because these fields are exactly sitting at the point where there's no current. Now you can say, what happens if I apply a voltage on the edge of the sample? Well, nothing will happen in terms of currents because all that will happen was the domain walls between the positive and negative fields just shift a little bit, leaving you with zero current. So that's why you have zero conductance and zero resistance in this minima. Uh, but this theory has a prediction that took a long time until a few years ago that the uh, von Klitzing, uh, uh, Schmidt, Jürgen Schmidt group uh, uh, verified that there are field domains and uh, that was actually a very nice result. They, in this paper, they showed that, first of all, they found the field domains because they found uh, voltages, photovoltages applying, uh, applied to different uh, uh, leads in the center. And in addition, they found flipping. These uh, field domains were flipping with telegraph noise, and the reason for that flipping is not known. Of course, there's arbitrariness in where the fields are, if it's positive or negative, but why should it flip in time and make noise? That's still open question. Uh, but the magnitude, that's the most important part, was in agreement with our prediction and not with uh, some other uh, papers that were written uh, at the same time. Uh, it's this magnitude. It's uh, the broadening of the Landau level divided by the Landau, uh, by, by the uh, cyclotron radius. So I just summarize. Uh, we could use Floquet states to describe steady states of condensed matter, extended system, not just in quantum optics. Uh, we could use them. Uh, uh, to calculate the uh, microwave modulation, modulated uh, Lando levels and add the effects of short range disorder and uh, see the uh, formation of uh, electric field states. Thanks. Okay, the single particle Hamiltonian really is a harmonic oscillator, driven harmonic oscillator. And that gives you Landau levels. Right. But you won't get any conductivity. Let's say you put some lifetime, you know, if you want to broaden them. That's exactly the point. The lifetime doesn't do, the, the lifetime broadens the Landau levels, but it won't give you any conductivity or any nonlinear conductivity, no field domains, all the interesting effects. You couple the harmonic oscillator. Exactly. It comes from how you treat the perturbations to the Hamiltonian that you can easily solve exactly. But since the Floquet transformation solves the broad and Landau levels exactly, your zeroth order Hamiltonian already captures a lot of the effects of disorder, and it's an easier work to do the perturbation theory in the short range disorder. So that's, that's that. The, the most important part in this problem was how to split the disorder into 
two different parts that have completely different effects. Okay. I'd like to ask you uh, myself, uh, the um, use of the time averaged Hamiltonian for Boltzmann weights, how do you justify that? In fact, uh, I know one example where this assumption fails. So okay, so, you know, it's like anything. It, it fails where the assumption, where it's not supposed to work. It, it's, it's essentially uh, a statement that you have a system where you exchange energy from a heat bath and the energy is conserved in that exchange, okay? So any unit of, you know, any joule of energy that comes from the heat bath goes into your system and then comes back, but no energy is accumulated, neither in the system or in the bath, over a period of time. So if you uh, work out essentially the conditions for that, it means that energy differences of uh, levels, uh, energy, any heat that comes in from the bath into the system has to correspond to the time average Hamiltonian. That's the statement. Now, if, if, if the time average Hamiltonian does not describe the density matrix, it means that your density matrix is not in thermal equilibrium to the bath, and there is a temperature gradient between them. There's, you know, it's, it's like two systems of different temperatures with heat flow between them. So I'm assuming the coupling is very strong. In other words, the heat conductivity between my irradiated system and the bath is very high, okay? So you don't get a temperature difference and the system is kept in equilibrium. This, of course, needs to be justified per case basis. There are systems which you drive them with light and they heat up to infinite temperature quite easily, and that's not the limit that I'm thinking about here. Okay, so I don't know if it answered you. Okay, we can discuss it. Any further comments? Yeah. What's the, uh, the field amplitude dependence of these effects? So, so presumably, obviously, you have a very low microwave. Uh, the, 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 is it a Rabi-like uh, dependence, or does it feel like the square root of the power? Or it goes like the power. Like e, e squared, yeah. And um, the field dependence is actually through Bessel functions. So it has a E squared. Okay, there are no Rabi oscillations in this problem. It's not like a two level system. What? It, it's, it's different than the Rabi. The Rabi is two, two level system that you mix and you split. Here, as you notice, the levels themselves don't, don't mix and split, okay? It's, it's a bit of a different, it's a, the, yeah, I, I think your intuition from Rabi is not correct for Landau levels. What I'm trying to understand is that there will be a portion of the squared effect to do with heating. Yeah. Eventually, the sigma uh, x y ought to become finite if I heat the system. You heat it, yes. Eventually, the microwave will heat the system, but initially, Okay, so you need to couple. Yeah, you need the system to be very well coupled to some to, to a bath that will take away any heating that goes on. That's my assumption. That actually is, I think, correct in this case. They used actually very long periods of uh, fields, and it didn't heat the system up because it was well coupled to uh, I don't know cold fingers or whatever you need. Uh, so so it it didn't cause over time terrible heating, like some other couplings do. This is uh, also important for the Floquet theory to work, that you're not heating the system. But, okay, we'll discuss more.